Welcome to the Skilled Nursing Facility Consolidated Billing NIST CB Wrap Up Webinar. This is the final in a series that started last October, so October of 2023, and it's running all the way through today. We've done various components as part of this series, so it has become a bigger topic. Now, keep in mind, this is the consolidated billing portion of it. We did do the SNF, the Skilled Nursing Facility Billing, and we are currently doing the Skilled Nursing Facility Clinical Section, which talks about the documentation, the assessments, and all of those. So this is still part of a bigger series. However, the consolidated billing portion is what's wrapping up with today's webinar. We will go through the questions that were submitted and we'll get through all of that information for you. I do wanna stop for just a second because one of the first questions I had was, um, where are this series and the information located? So I wanna take you out and I'm just gonna show you a website here. It's the YouTube website. Now on YouTube, if you search for government health administrators, you'll find our website now, WPS, Government Health Administrators. You can also just put um, at WPS, educate, GHA, Education. It will bring you right to our website. This is what we're looking for. Now, a lot of people say, hey, I got a variety of different things out there. What am I actually going to look for? What do I want to do? You can search it. I do recommend if you want to see all of our playlists, come to our playlist section. That's where you're going to find this information. The reason that I say that is we have two very distinct portions for skilled nursing facilities. One is the overall consolidated billing. That is where you're going to find all of the parts of this series. The second one is the skilled nursing facility. This one talks specifically about how a skilled nursing facility bills Medicare, the clinical components, all of those different things. So they're different. This consolidated billing is a general playlist available for everyone affected by consolidated billing. The skilled nursing facility playlist is only for the skilled nursing facilities, how you do your billing, all of those different things. With that said, this will definitely apply to this class. Keep in mind when we talk about consolidated billing, it's not skilled nursing facility billing. It is the whether or not you should include that service in this portion. Um, and by this portion, I mean, should it go to the SNF to be billed or should it come to Medicare to be billed or should we actually bill the patient? And we're going to talk about that. All right. So hopefully that helps you answer that question. You can kind of see where those different um, ones are available. Somebody did ask, you know, you do put them on your website for a period of time. How long is that? It's usually 60 to 90 days, but that's dependent upon how long they take to get posted. And then we only keep them out there for a certain number of months that we don't have so many on our website. So you could also find them on our website. A couple of things, disclaimers about this education. Uh, it was and is current as of today. We checked everything. It looks good. It's current. However, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website maintains all the current rules, laws, and regulations, and you do want to check that. Today's website, later on, I will show you some web re website resources, and we want to make sure you're aware of those because that's where you're going to find the most current information. We did and are going to provide answers to questions. The questions that were given during registration, I will have those presented to me and you'll hear them exactly as they were given. Some of the questions I'm able to answer, other ones I may not be able to answer, um, but I can only use what you gave me in the question to do that. So always remember Medicare rules and regulations are gonna prevail over the answers that I get. If you add in extra detail, take away your details, do something different with that question, it may not be a universal question, it may not apply in that manner. Last, CMS does prohibit the recording of this presentation for profit-making purposes. Because we cannot ensure how you're going to use this recording, we ask that you don't record, screenshot, or do any other method um, like that. What we will do is record it, and pending the quality of that recording, we will then post it onto our YouTube as an encore. I just showed you the playlist where you want to go for that. So we'll post it out there. Hopefully, we'll have that done within the next 30 days. It'll be available to you. Now, the encore playlist, the one that um, I'm asking Karen to put into the chat, it's going to have everything you can possibly imagine on it. Um, and that is every single webinar we've done versus the skilled nursing facility consolidated billing and the skilled nursing facility um, playlist. So take a look at those if you're interested. Today, we're gonna do just a pretty general overview of skilled nursing facility consolidated billing. Now keep in mind, I use the term general overview because it's a higher level. We're not gonna get really in depth into everything. We are gonna talk about the CMS files. I'll show those to you after I talk about them and explain them. And then we're gonna do the question and answer. Our goal for this webinar was to answer all of your final questions from the entire series. So it does begin um, with an overview because 
we did have some base questions um, for people that didn't attend the rest of the series and they wanted a little bit of information. Keep in mind, it's going to be a small portion of the entire information. We built a six-part series based on all of it, so it's too much to get through in one webinar. So let's go ahead and get started with that overview. As I said, this is a high-level categorical type summary. It's not going to give you all the in-depth details that the other playlists will, but I'm going to try to give you as best I can. Um, if you have questions, put them in. We'll get to them at the end after we get through all of the presentation material, and then also we're going to get through some um, registration questions. Consolidated billing or SNF consolidated billing is a form of bundle. It says that the SNF is responsible for some or most of the care. Now we say some or most because there are services that are beyond the scope of the SNF. And then there are also caveats provided during those. When a SNF is responsible, they are the ones that must put it onto their claim. They must codify that service and send it to Medicare. If they don't do that, then Medicare will deny it and the provider will not be paid directly through Medicare. On the other hand, when the SNF puts it on their claim, it becomes part of their payment. Now, um, that payment then incorporates them to send off that payment to the other provider. And that's what we're talking about by consolidated billing. So again, it's a portion of bundling. And what that portion does is says that you must bill the SNF for payment. The SNF bills Medicare. Medicare then um, pays the SNF and the SNF pays you. Also, it does say that there are certain services that are beyond the scope of the SNF. So that bundle recognizes that there are exceptions. We'll talk more about those exceptions in just a little bit. When we talk about a SNF, we talk about stays. And there's a Part A stay and a Part B stay. Now, some people say Part B stay doesn't make sense to me, and I'll explain it. But a Part A stay, let's start with that one. A Part A stay is during a benefit period, which is a total measurement of Part A stays. Now, it doesn't matter if it is on um, what type of facility it is, it's a total measurement of inpatient stay, period. And that stay says, okay, for a SNF, we're going to pay you 100 days. It doesn't say consecutive days, it says days. Because it begins the benefit period, the portion that we talk about, is actually um, needs a 60 day inpatient break. That's why it's not one continual stay. But once you reach that 100 days, Medicare no longer pays your room, board, nursing charges, all of those Part A things. Instead, they say we can still pay certain things that are under Part B. So like your therapy, your outpatient um, rehab therapy would be an example. You could also be paid for some other types of services. There's certain drugs that are under Part B. There's certain visits that are under Part B. And there's certain other services that will come through um, under Part B. So Part A say references when Medicare is paying for the facility, the bed, the room, the board, all of that. Part B say is saying, okay, that 100 days is done, and now what Medicare is going to pay for is only services that are classified under Part B. They're still built through the SNF. The difference is under a Part B say, only rehabilitation services, PT, OT, SLP, and some and social worker services are part of the SNF. You have to build them back to the SNF. The reason for that is, is during that, even though they're not getting paid for that, that full 100 inpatient days is already done, they're getting, they're, they're in the skilled nursing facility because they need those services, and that's part of the skilled nursing facility benefit. That's why it's not separately payable. Everything else would be separately payable. And under Part A, when they're in that first 100 days, it is different, and we have two categorical lists to help us understand that. And we'll talk about those lists available on the CMS website. So again, a Part A stay, Medicare is paying room, board, nursing charges, and all of that. A Part B stay, Medicare is not paying room, board, or nursing charges. On the other hand, both stays are medically necessary. They're still required. The patient still needs it medically. So hopefully that um, kind of helps define those two types of stays. Excluded services. This is a question that we got, and one of them was, what, when can I bill, even though I'm billing the SNF, they don't pay it, when can I bill a patient? This is key because excluded services from Medicare and excluded services from SNF consolidated billing are different. Medicare excluded services are from the law. They're excluded period, they're never paid. The SNF's not going to pay you because the SNF can't bill Medicare for them. Um, this would be something like a comfort item, so a fan, for instance, or um, an item that is not part of the regulation. So you go in for an eye exam and you have the refraction. Uh, you go in and you have chiropractic services that are not manual spinal manipulation. 
those are all excluded services. Okay? Um, so they have to be very specifically done. Also, part of that would be not medically necessary services. The SNF isn't responsible for those. Now, the difference between that and a skilled nursing facility excluded services, this is the list that's gonna be available on the CMS website. It is by procedure code. And what it says is the SNF isn't responsible for paying these services, instead bill these to Medicare directly. So you have a Medicare excluded services, which either Medicare or the SNF will pay, and a SNF consolidated billing excluded service, which just Medicare pays, not the skilled nursing facility. We're gonna take a look at that um, website and those lists in just a little while, but we wanna get to the basic information. The question is who bills for a SNF excluded service? That was the question that was presented. The answer is it's always going to be the performing provider. If it's an exclusion from consolidated billing, they're going to bill Medicare. Who bills for a Medicare excluded service? And the answer to that question is the provider who perform the service or their billing staff, but they bill the patient because Medicare will never cover it. So one is excluded because it's coming to Medicare and the other is excluded because it's being billed to the patient. So hopefully you understand. I will use the term excluded services during this class, but I'm gonna to refer to SNF consolidated billing excluded services unless I specify Medicare excluded services. So for most part, we're gonna talk excluded services being SNF consolidated billing excluded services. Reimbursement. So um, reimbursement includes payment for both Part A and per Part B services. A SNF can bill for both. So it doesn't matter the category that it falls under for Medicare. The SNF can actually bill for both and they're both billed on a UB04. Now we say Part B services, but we do exclude most professional services. Again, what type of professional service is not excluded? The re outpatient rehabilitation services, not excluded. Social work services, and any other thing defined by procedure code. So we wanna make that very aware. And I'm gonna show you the list to talk about reimbursements and which ones are included and excluded, and we'll talk more about that. But remember, all Part A services for the most part will be included, except for those that are way beyond the scope of the SNF. And we'll talk more about those in just a little while. So reimbursement is done to the SNF and it can be for Part A and for Part B services. When the SNF bills, this is one of the questions that we put in um, because some of the providers that bill the SNF don't have an understanding of how their claims can actually affect and cause payment issues with the skilled nursing facility. So the question was from a um, outpatient diagnostic center who does have to bill the SNF for certain services and what they were looking for is, you know, we're, we're billing later and the SNF is coming back saying, hey, you're causing all kinds of issues. And by later, they didn't define that. I don't know if it's six months later, a year later, I'm not really sure what they're doing with that. They're, they just said later. So I thought we'll build this in and give you guys a little explanation here. So when a SNF sends their claim, now keep in mind, all services must be on the claim. They bill one an initial claim. This says, hey, we started them, this is for the first monthly. Then they bill increments each monthly thereafter and these are interim claims. The final claim is what's considered a discharge claim. Now keep in mind that they do have to bill these in chronological order and they have to process before billing the next one in the chronological order. So it's very key to make sure everything gets built into effect in that manner. So, Medicare pays the claims in the chronological order that they are submitted. Late charges can actually stop this claim. They have to fix it. They have to correct it. They have to add those late charges. <coughs> I apologize for that. Once the late charges are added, the claim has to reprocess and make sure everything is good. That can affect the processing of any claim following that. All those interim claims stop and have to be reprocessed. So we know this happens. So to answer your question, if you don't submit a claim when they first go to bill it and they have to stop their claims, it can cause payments to be taken back because now we have to adjust other things. They can cause them to not be able to bill additional months once those happen. So we really wanna make sure we get this system done and we're working as best we can to do this together to get the payments done as quickly as possible. All right, I'm gonna talk to the CMS website files and I will tell you they are available on the, um, website. What I will do is once I talk about them, um, we'll show them to you. Now, I'll go back and forth a little bit as I go through this section because it's not an all or nothing section. I will show you the CMS website. I'll show you the file. We'll talk back and forth, kind of helping you through a little bit. The slides will follow my progression through showing you the different pieces of information. 
So Part A file. First of all, I want to say this is a Part A stay. So the, in order for a Part A file to apply, the patient must be in a skilled nursing facility 100 days medically necessary stay. Now, again, that's all done through the documentation portion, which is not part of this class. If you want to document medical necessity, you know, attend, check out our live events page, check out all of that. We have other classes coming up on that. Check out YouTube, check out those encores. That's out there for you. What they say is once we've established that it's a medically necessary stay and Medicare Part A is covering, we're going to call it a Part A covered stay, we then have to exclude certain services that are beyond the scope of a SNF. And that's what these five major categories do. So the first one is just excluded services beyond the scope of a SNF. The second one is additional when rendered to specific beneficiaries, additional excluded services, and then um, rendered by certified providers, preventive screening. Now, keep in mind, preventive says the SNF has to bill them, but it's not part of their, um, their, their, their daily rate, I guess is what we're going to call it. It's, there is it a big long name. It's part of their prospective payment system, but it's a separate factor, so they get paid separately. Um, so we'll talk more about those because the SNF has to bill those, but they do get a separate payment. And then we have the included and consolidated billing, always, always, forever, forever. And if you notice, it says Part B. That is the one file that says these are therapy services. And so even though they're in a Part B state, you still have to build a SNF. We're going to talk about these different categories. Let's start with Major Category 1. Inside Major Category 1, they break them into service types. Now, they also will break this down by procedure code. So each procedure code must be put on there, and it's very important that you have this. So you can see a CT scans would be an A, CAF, MRIs. Um, the reason that you see the word under S, and it's got a big, bold inclusion, and this is for your outpatient surgery and their related procedures, but then you want to make sure that you look at the exclusion list as well. If you notice, I is also about surgeries, but that one I put all in caps would be a little bit different. And those are your um, exclusions. So one is an inclusion and one is an exclusion um, list. And we did have some questions come up about that. And you want to make sure that you're following those two lists. Now, I will show you those in just a little while in a bit more, um, a better explanation when I actually show those to you. Also, there are, are caveats that go with certain things with major category one. Very specifically, it says these have to be performed in a hospital, which would include a critical access hospital. So if you have something like an MRI done in a freestanding diagnostic or something like that where it's not being done in a hospital setting, then it is the SNF's responsibility. But if you don't, then it's the, if you do it in a hospital, then the hospital bills directly for it, I guess is the better way of saying it. So if it's done in a freestanding, if it's not done in a hospital or critical access hospital, if it's not done there, then you need to build a SNF. If it is done there, then you bill Medicare directly. And again, this is all based in procedure code. The key thing you're going to have to know is what is the procedure code you're going to build to look up whether or not it meets one of these exceptions. And I'll show you that file in just a few moments here. Next, you have major category two. Now, remember, these ones are very specific to end-stage renal disease and hospice selection. That's the two key things. And then it says, if they have end-stage renal disease stuff done in an end-stage renal disease facility, then the end-stage renal disease can be billed separately. Okay, well, that makes sense because the facility itself is going to bail on that's outside. But if not, then the SNF would still be responsible for it. So, again, caveats, right? Um, if you've elected a hospice provider, then these are Medicare certified, then only billed by the hospice provider. These are the services the hospice provider must perform. That's part of the election and they are billed to the hospice Medicare Administrative Contractor, or MAC, versus us. So it gets very tricky with this, because there are still services that are not part of hospice that they could have, and they're medically necessary services, and those could be part of consolidated billing. So we'll talk more about those different caveats, and we'll look some more at those in just a little while. Major category three. Um, if you are a licensed Medicare provider, so you've gone through the full enrollment process, the services listed in major category three are excluded from the SNF PPS and consolidated done. Now, the PPS is the Prospective Payment System, PPS. That system is what drives and puts together all of the consolidated billing components, and that's why it's excluded from that. Um, and so if you perform any of these services, and if you are a Medicare licensed or certified provider, then it's expected that you'll go Medicare directly. And again, it's going to be based in procedure code, and I know that we haven't quite got to those files yet, so we'll get there. 
major category four, preventive and screening services only billable by the SNF. So if the patient is in a Part A phase, now please note it says Part A. This means that once they remain in a medically necessary state, but the Part A 100 days are expired, then the provider performing this service would bill the, um, bill the Medicare contractor, Medicare administrative contractor directly versus the SNF. However, if they're in that Part A stay portion, then it becomes the SNF's responsibility. Now they do have to bill it, but it's not part of their, their actual daily per diem rate under the prospective payment system. So it really depends on what point they are at in um, all of those different levels. And the major category five is just, doesn't matter if it's covered Part A or B, if it's medically necessary, what we're looking at is you have to build the SNF, it's automatically gonna be sent in by the SNF. These are your therapy services, your outpatient rehabilitation, PCOT, SLP services. That's what we're talking about when we talk about major category five. All right. I know I flipped it to part B side, but what I would like to do is just take a moment and we're going to jump to the website. What we're going to leave is we're going to go to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website. We're going to look up the part A file and we're going to talk, you know, just kind of show you those files. I'm not going to go in depth. There is a whole class on that as well. So when we come to Medicare, we come to coding and billing, on the right column, you'll see the skilled nursing facility or SNF consolidated billing. The first thing that comes up are the Part B files. So that's what we're gonna go through next. But if you scroll down, you'll see these Part A files. These are the ones that we're talking about here. I always tell everyone, just go straight to the Part A math update. Now, Somebody asked what's new and what's affected. These are the new codes that were added, changed, affected, any of that type of information that you may need to know. So this is where you're gonna find the what's new for consolidated building portions. And it is actual procedure code and it'll tell you the major categories and all the different things you need to know. So you wanna make sure you're well aware of these codes because these codes may not be in these rules. Okay? First thing, I'm going to open up the second file first under downloads in the very bottom of the page, I'm gonna open up the general explanation. The reason I'm cho choosing to do this is because this is just exactly what I went through, only in a lot more detail. So if you say, hey, what do I have to do? Well, okay, it's an emergency room, but the, the associated file has to be a 045X, which is emergency room. So we know that there's certain things. Yeah, it's not just an emergency service, it has to be filled in this type of claim. If it's not, then okay, now we're in a different situation. So it has to be an emergency hospital, it has to be with revenue code 045X, zero being space holder, but 45X. Um, and then it has to have the same line item data service. All of those different things have to match. If it doesn't, then the ER exception does not apply. So a variety of different factors are coming into that. And that's really why I just wanted to show this to you. It's pretty much everything um, in, in a very high level that we just went through. Okay. The files themselves are zip files, and I'm gonna go ahead and select it here. We're gonna hope this opens up real quick, but what's gonna happen is it's gonna say, hey, you need to unzip this software. Where do you wanna store this? So I'm gonna store it on a drive for myself and it's gonna download it. And then it's gonna say, how do you wanna open it? Um, here is my zip file. I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. And then you can see it's this here. I will select a view that allows me to open it in File Explorer. And then you can see the file. Now, um, both of these are going to be uh, cell files. The comma space is one that is more of a programming file. The XLS is the one that you're going to be more used to using. So it's just a workbook. Let's just go ahead and open that one up. And what will happen is it's going to be just a big, long list of procedure codes, and then it's going to give you major categories, and you're like, oh, my goodness. That's why that general explanation, that PDF that I first showed you, is so key and so important, because if you don't understand what you're looking at, Wow, this is really big. Let me, let me make this a little bit smaller here. Um, hopefully this is a, a decent size here. And you can see it's gonna give you a major category. It's gonna give you all the different items you need to know. Um, and so this will start way back up at major category one. So you're gonna have your procedure code and this is very important, your major category, and then it'll give you certain things like your descriptors. But keep in mind, all the caveats are in that first PDF document that I showed you and explained. So what I would say is uh, if you have a certain procedure code, I recommend using control F, which is edit, find, or however you want to do that. And you're just going to put a procedure code in. So um, 0842. OK, 
Okay. Not liking that. Let's do this. I don't know why it's not liking this today, but what it should do is just find it. So it would say, hey, here we go, 70842. Oh, it's sheet rows formulas. So anyway, it would then find this, you know, it's going to tell you it's major category one. A, here's what you have to know about that. You can do this with any given procedure code. Again, um, the find feature. Huh. So uh, different ways to do that. If you aren't finding it and it's not working for you like this, you can scroll through and use any find or sort feature you want. Um, some people prefer to use a sort feature and then they'll throw that on like this. And they're gonna use a filter and they're gonna say, I'm gonna filter that. Mm -mm -mm. Let's say 70842. Okay, so it didn't find it. Uh, here's all the seven, whatever it's going to find for you, and you can then select it. Um, sometimes if you put an O and a zero, it will affect your feature, so I want to make sure you're well aware of that. So then you can read through all these different files, and that's one of the biggest files you're going to have to use. Now, keep in mind, this is for Part A today. And so when we say Part A versus Part B, remember there are certain things that are categorized as Part B. And that's what we're going to go through next. We're going to jump right back to our PowerPoint. Now, the Part B files are for Part B services that are only ever payable to Part B, such as professional services, and that's what your first two will be. And then the Part B also incorporates what happens when it's not a Part A stay. That's what your third one is, that's your ambulance services. And then the therapy services, which will always be medically necessary, under a medically necessary portion, but billable to the SNF. So they give this to us in both the Part A and B files. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the four files. Uh, and then we'll get into showing you them. So professional services, not a part of a skilled nursing facility consolidated billing. Keyword there, facility. So a doctor's visit is not a facility charge, never gonna be. We actually remove the component of the facility and you wanna make sure you codify that correctly. So if they are inpatient, make sure that you're using the correct place of service. It is not an office. Even if they come to your office, Medicare still doesn't pay that because we say, why didn't you go, or why didn't they go to the um, facility and see them? That's where we expected it to be. So you want to make sure you're using the correct license of service. The next one says it's a professional component, not part, not part of the skilled nursing facility consolidated billing. This one says that there's a professional and a technical component. So if you think about that, a lot of our diagnostic services, our x-rays, labs, they all have a professional and a technical. Technical is a facility fee, which would go to the skilled nursing facility. Professional is the actual medical professional reading it. That would be billed with a 20 stitch. And as long as that 20 stitch is appended on that code, it gets billed to Medicare. Very different than appending the TC. Now we have had people, and one of the questions was, do I have to build a facility the TC code? That is up to the facility to decide. You do have to only bill them the TC amount, whatever that is by Medicare and defined in that way. You have to bill them separately. So we wanna make sure we're aware of that. When you bill Medicare, if you bill the entire code without a modifier, without the 26 modifier, we will deny it, stating that is part of the skilled nursing facility. A lot of skilled nursing facilities do the same thing. You build it without a modifier, they deny it, saying it's supposed to go to Medicare. And the reality is you should be breaking that into two separate charges, one for the technical and one for the professional, and you should be billing accordingly. So that's what that list is saying. Now, ambulance services separately billable when bundling does not apply. Keep in mind, the first thing you have to understand when you are looking is this is a Part B list. This means the patient must be in a Part B stay. We also had a category way up above in the Part A list that talked about ambulance services when they're in a Part A stay. It is two separate lists, so make sure that you're using that appropriately. Um, and then therapy services, and I've already explained that one pretty well. I think it's just your PCOT, SLP, those types of therapy services that have to go as long as the patient remains in a medically necessary stay. So, we did bring up the more information slide. What I'm going to do here is stop for a second. We're going to jump back to the website. And the reason we're going to do this is because the um, list that we're looking for is back on our website. And here we're in Part A list. Now, again, we're going to move to the Part B list. We're going to tell you, first of all, if you want to know what's effective in the changes, it's going to tell you. Here's where you see those changes that have occurred, the important things you have to be aware of. 
some of those changes may not be on these lists. You want to make sure you're well aware of what's going on. Then each file is broken down. And again, we're going to use procedure codes. These are all zipped files. So you want to make sure you're using the correct procedure code based on the patient status, especially for ambulance. The Part A state, you're going to use the MAC A update. If it's a Part B state, you're going to use the Part B file. So hopefully we understand that a little bit better. Now keep in mind, if it's an excluded service under the Part A state, then yes, we understand that you will drop the Part B files because it becomes a Part B service. A little, little confusing there, and there's a whole class on that one out there as well. So. Um, again, these lists look almost exactly the same as the other ones. So I'm just going to download this first one. You can see again, I give me a little bit of a different name. Going to save it right there. We're going to go ahead and hey, if the survey pops up, feel free to take that. We'd love to hear your feedback. So it's CMS. So take our survey. Oops, sorry. Um, we're going to go ahead and open this file right up. And by doing that, we'll go ahead and see that again. You do have. Um, the documents, the same two documents, are same type and use the same two CCMAT. I'm going to open up the Excel file. And again, by doing this, the um, text document is one, it's not going to be in a user friendly, reader friendly format. It's designed for programming, so it's designed automatically, just like the CSV file was. This is the actual one that will be designed to help us understand. And here you can see, okay, here's the procedure code, find your procedure code, and you're good. And if you find the procedure code on this list, don't bill it's considered a professional. So, um, and it'll tell you, okay, this is file one. So keep in mind, we're just looking at the different things like that. Hopefully this all makes sense to everyone. All right, so those are our basic files and information you'll need. If you have something very specific, I do recommend taking time to go out and look at it and get through that information. Well, the next slide in the presentation was actually something that we put together, and that slide is designed for you guys um, in terms of just giving you some additional resources, some additional items that you might want to be aware of. Um, again, kind of going through all the different things covering in the entire course. Which brings us to questions, and I'm going to have Karen start off just asking me questions, and we'll get through these. So go ahead, Karen. Okay. Now, these are the pre-submitted questions uh, that were sent in during the registration process. So, I am reading these as they were sent to us. Um, the first is, is it ever appropriate to bill mem a member if the SNF denies? And it can absolutely be appropriate. And let me explain that a little bit, a little bit clearer. We're going to go back to when we talked about the slide for excluded services. Are we talking about an excluded service period, uh, which means Medicare is never going to pay for it, it's excluded, or are we talking about a consolidated, that SNF consolidated billing excluded service? So what type of excluded service? I'm going to use a quick resource here to help you out. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, inside of here, when we're looking at excluded services, things Medicare never covers, you can go back to Medicare right up here on the top. We're going to go regulations and guidance, and we're going to go manual. Now, the reason that I like to bring these to the manual is these are our day-to-day -day operating instructions. So, this website talks about that, and you could go out to the Social Security Act and read through the entire sections of the Social Security Act under 1862, 1861. It's Title 18, and you can get through a ton of information. However, CMS has given us instructions as a contractor and you as a provider how we operate within Medicare. That's where I'm going right now. And they're called internet only manuals. So you go to manuals, again, Medicare, regulations and guidance, and then manuals, all right off that first screen. Once we get there, we go to the internet only manuals. These are your day to day operating instructions. The one that I'm going to use this time is the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, 100 02. Once we open that up, we're just going to scroll down. Now, it goes through all kinds of things. This is when, you know, services are covered. This is how it works. This is all kinds of stuff you want to know. The one that we really want to look for underneath this section, and we talk about excluded is section, or I'm sorry, chapter 16. If a service falls into chapter 16, these services will always be billed to the patient. Keep in mind, this is different than when it should be this responsibility to pay and this is not paying. That's a different type of question. The question asks is when can you bill the patient directly if the SNF denies it? The services listed in here are what you're looking for. 
Also, if it's not medically necessary and you inform the patients of this. So let's talk about that in general. Medicare requires an advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage. Let's say you look up in one of our policies, national or local, and it says this service for this diagnosis code is not covered today. So because of that, and it was that service for that diagnosis code, you told the patient in advance, if you've done that, then you would um, not be able to bill, or you could potentially bill Medicare, but it would be a non-covered service, and therefore that would be something that you would append a GA modifier on and be able to bill the patient directly. So there's a variety of different factors that play into that, and you want to make sure you're following the correct rules. Each one of those situations, though, does have another course available and more in-depth information if you would like it. Karen, can we take the next question? Sure. Uh, the next question, I'm going to read it with the abbreviations provided. CB in OP wound care in HOD for patients with and without HH services. Okay, so I'm going to interpret this one a little bit, and this is where um, I said sometimes when you guys give us questions, we're going to interpret and give you the best answer we can. So I'm going to get to you, it's consolidated billing in, I'm sorry, what was the next set of abbreviations? <laughs> OP Out, wound oh. care. So we say outpatient wound care in a hospital outpatient setting, hospital outpatient department, and we're looking for information on, finish that one up. For patients with and without HH, so home health services. Okay, so home health. Whew. So you see that was a big category, lots of going on there. And so sometimes it's better to spell it out and make sure that I'm not missing an acronym, but this is my interpretation of what you're asking me for this one. So first of all, if it's under a home health care plan, um, let's start there. That would go to home health care. And you have to follow the home health care rules and regulations. So a consolidated billing in home health care may not always play the nicest together. I'm not gonna lie because home health care is an expectation. If the patient's in a skilled nursing facility, that's a different expectation. So we wanna make sure we're not doing the same thing. So the home health care uh, being in, into effect is definitely a different situation. Um, and, and you need to be aware of that, that they're under a home health care plan and then that would overrule some of the consolidated billing rules because they should be getting those services in the home health care and the home health care should be responsible for those. A variety of different factors go in there. So, Without the home health care plan, those types of services, we have to have a procedure code and we have to be able to look those up first of all to confirm that they are part of consolidated billing. Because each type of service does play a little bit differently and also factoring in things like uh, who did the service, other things like that would then factor into different items. Um, so I'm not sure I'm really able to answer that question super effectively. Um, hopefully that is a little bit of guidance, but again, get your procedure code, start there, determine whether there is a home health care plan if you need more clarification or you want more on that one, please put some more information into the chat to help me understand exactly what you're looking for. In the meantime, we'll take the next question. Okay, next question is revenue code 360, which would be operating room services on a SNF claim. Mm, okay, now this is that one that we talked about when we were talking about the part A files on the CMS website. And remember I said that in the Part A files, we actually have two different set of pieces of information. And so if you notice me moving, I'm actually moving back to those files for you here. Um, and when we talk about the Part A files, whoops, too far. You wanna check out these explanations and you're gonna look at the major categories. And again, the major category, there's two different ones you have to look at when you talk about surgical procedures. First of all, it always is gonna fall into a hospital or other hospital to be excluded. So if you're doing anything in an ambulatory surgery center, not excluded, okay? Then if it's in a hospital or critical access hospital, you have to look for whether or not it's on the inclusion list below. Now, remember there's so many surgeries that a SNF cannot perform. That's why there is an, in an inclusion list. It's just too much. But then you also do have to fall back down to additional services that may be within that category. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at both of these. Now, these are the ones that don't fall within the outpatient surgical code range. So you wanna make sure we're aware of what is happening with these two different categories and how they play together. But without a direct procedure code, I can't really talk a whole lot more about that um, other than to say, check your list, make sure that it is an inclusion or an exclusion and go from there. Um, 
So we'll go ahead and take the next question. Again, if you need more help, let me know. Okay, this next question, Tom, can be kind of a broad one too. It was it says, what documentation is needed? Oh, okay. Um, next question, documentation. So keep in mind always it's a matter for consolidated billing or not. The skilled nursing facility has certain documentation requirements that they must meet. This is part of their um man or their uh their information to get billed and paid correctly. So the documentation they need, they're going to require from you. I will tell you some base documentation that's needed. One, patient identifying information. This includes the patient's name, date of birth, sex code, all of those basic things that Medicare would need. You need to be able to build a SNF so the SNF can build them. And if it's not billable to the SNF, then you need it because you have to be able to build Medicare. And you have to match the Medicare system. We want to be very careful, especially in documentation, where you have someone and their name doesn't match exactly and Medicare can't determine that it's for that person. Um, also, um, documentation, I guess, would include the medical necessity component. Um, I'm going to see if Mary Sue is on and I'm going to have her also chime in if she has anything for this kind of generalized one. Now, Mary Sue is one of our clinicians. She is able to better talk about some of the documentation components. I'm not sure that she wants to get into the assessments, but is there any kind of general documentation information you'd like to offer, Mary Sue? Um, there is not, Tom. We have a bunch of different um, information on our YouTube channel and even the skilled nursing facility page on our website um, for the medical review, five claim sniff reviews has information about documentation. And really, since Tom's focus today is you know, in the consolidated billing portion, there's not anything really different for documentation that needs to be kept. The only thing that I do encourage, and, and I don't know how much Tom has, has said this already, if your patient's leaving your facility, make sure they're leaving with a piece of paper or something that says that, I, that the patient is in an active of nursing facility part A stay. So if they happen to show up at um, a physician's office, something like that, where consolidated billing applies, that that physician's office knows how to bill that appropriately. And that's all I have. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mary Sue. The information Mary Sue just talked about with those uh, agreements and those papers that go out and all that, check out the skilled nursing facility working together for efficiency webinar. That webinar is available, it is in the playlist, and it's gonna have all of that information. We talk about all the different agreements that CMS offers as sample agreements. They're not required, but they are sample agreements. So there's a lot of information also available on that um, that we do think is important for you guys to have um, as well. We're back on the consolidated billing page. I'm always gonna tell you guys, um, there's gonna be a variety of pages affected. If I come down, you can see a variety of different items and publications here. Take a look at any of that. Um, so not really sure when you're talking about uh, documentation, what more you need from that. So if there's something specific, please feel free to hit us up in that chat feature and we'll answer that. Other than that though, we're gonna move on. Okay, our next question says patient-driven payment model info. Okay, that's the PDPN. I'm gonna take a look out here, um, what I'm gonna do. And if you guys are wondering when I say out here, what I'm specifically going to is YouTube. Um, I'm going to look at the skilled nursing facility. I'm not sure what documentation Mary had or Mary Sue's already done on this. So let's take a look and see. Um, no, we don't want this to play, but we can look through the entire list and see, do we have anything on PDPM? Um, and if not, I know it is coming up. So here's some, you know, basic documentation stuff, five day reviews, all kinds of stuff on that. So if you want to take a look at this, you can help. Oh, Minimum data sets. Also, though, come right out here. Check it out. Let's see. Maybe we got another class coming up on PDPM, and let's take a look at that. So we're going to go to the WPF website. And the first thing I did on my website or on our website is I just clicked the training center. Didn't go into any of the topics. Right to training center. By that, I'm going to click live events, and it's going to open up, and I can look through all the different stuff coming up. Uh, minimum data set is here. I don't see. That's minimum data. So. So we're going through all the different minimum data set. Um, 
And I'm not sure, maybe Mary Sue will know if she's already done the PDPM class, if that would be in an encore setting um, or if that is coming up. Mary Sue, do you, do you know if you've done that already or not? Hi, Tom. Yes, there is education um, on our encore page specific to PDPM. And then I've been doing various parts of the um, MDS and PDPM, how um, those sections affect your payment drivers especially for medical review. So um, there is a class tomorrow on section I. Uh, last week there was a class on section GG. Next week there'll be one on section O. And like I said, there's various information out on our skilled nursing facility five claim probe reviews that are happening and about every other month I do a webinar just on those review findings. So um, if there are certain sections of um, PDPM and, and um, the minimum data set that you want further education on, when this webinar closes and you go to do the survey, please feel free to put that in the survey comments. There's a section there that allows for what other kind of education do you need in the future and put those suggestions in there. And I will um, hopefully pick that up as an educational event for you. Thanks. All right, so I just wanted to let you guys know, um, I was looking down the list for it. It's the video that actually opened on the skilled nursing facility, the payment driven payment. The payment driven payment system, patient driven payment system, PDPM. It was the first video that opened, which is why I didn't find it on the list, it's because it actually popped right up and started playing for me. Um, so it is available to you. Go ahead, check that out. I'm going to move on to the next question. Okay, next question. All that we got in the registration was standing ER. So, okay. Um, I'm going to make a best guess at this one and maybe say standing ER orders or maybe orders to the ER. And either way, we don't really look at that. Um, we need the medical necessity. So you can say this person has to go to the ER, but unless there's a medical reason to transport that person to the ER and that's documented appropriately, a standing order alone doesn't establish that. It can help support it, though, definitely. We just want to make it clear that you still have to show within the documentation um, what they're looking for. I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. And ask you guys to put some more information in chat if that was your question, because I don't have a whole lot to go on other than that. And then we're going to go ahead and move on. Okay, next question is drugs not covered by SNF consolidated billing. Okay, yeah, so drugs not covered by SNF consolidated billing. When we look at the consolidated billing list, again, I'm going to go back to the CMS website. Um, I'll use the file explanations for this one. It'll be a little bit easier. Um, there's a list of drugs that are covered, and so you can see major category 2A dialysis, and this will cover some of the drugs. Chemotherapy covers some of the drugs. But if you can't find the procedure code for what you're billing for underneath here, now this could be um, differential drugs, dyes, anything like that. It just depends on what you're looking for there with the drug. Um, we want to really make sure we're following into certain things under these categories. Uh, drug, this is a, you know, blood clotting factor here would be one under major category 3. So just make sure that when you're looking at it, you're using, again, the procedure code, you're using this list, you're looking for the drug code, and then you go on from there. And that's how you're going to determine whether or not they're billed to Medicare or to skilled nursing facility consolidated billing. Uh, Karen, can we get the next question? Sure. While you're on this part right now, I just wanted um, one of the questions that you got was any changes for 2024. So I just wanted to bring that up now because you are showing where they can find that updated information. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So part A would be under the part A files and part B will be under the part B files. This is where you're going to find those changes. Okay, next question we have is the type of E&M to bill when a patient is seen in office at a provider's office, but the SNF status is inpatient stay. It's going to be a nursing facility E&M. Remember, I talked about that as it follows the patient's inpatient care. Now, key things to remember, it has to be medically necessary and Part A has to be covering it. So if it's within the first 100 days, that's when we're going to bill those nursing facility codes. If it's outside those 100 days, um, then it falls back into the regular E&M office codes because the facility is not being paid anymore. A little bit different there. And so you really have to look at 
and, and communicate with the SNF. Are you still being paid? Hey, are you still within a part A stay? Those are the questions you want to ask. Um, I don't have a reference off the top of my head for that, but we could provide that to you. If you want that, uh, email us and we'll get that to you later on. But you've got to send us an email, otherwise we'll just assume that that, that answer is going to be what you need. Next question. Okay, while we're on the topic of evaluation and management um, codes, there was a question that got added to the chat um, from Cindy, and she gave some really specific codes in some places of service. So, Cindy, if, if Tom's answer that he just gave, if that answers your question, let me know. Otherwise, we can still go on to your question, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, while we wait for Cindy, our next, our last, uh, pre-submitted question is what do we do when the nursing home just will not pay mm, okay so this is a legal matter and, and let me explain that cms says that because the nursing home is responsible it was part of their participation agreements it was part of the things they agreed to when they agreed to medicare so it's all part of those um, federal regulations as to what they're agreeing to it does become a legal matter um and so when you look at the Social Security Act and, and you look at the, the code of participation and the, and the participation agreement stuff within that, that's where we're coming from with that. Now, Medicare cannot be involved because it is between you and the nursing home. If a nursing home refuses to pay, it is something that you have to seek advice on from a legal counsel to say, hey, this is the situation. Um, you know, a piece of advice from us is treat it like anyone else that owes you money. You would put them into collections for it. You would do all of those different things. That's a piece of advice from us. We can't tell you what to legally do. We can't force you to do any of that. What we can tell you is that if the skilled nursing facility is responsible for payment, don't bill the patient. That we can say, because that is not appropriate action to have, um, have happened there. So again, contact your legal counsel, check out the code of participation rules, um, all of those different types of things that will help you through that. Do we have any other questions submitted in the chat? Um, we do. I'm going to go ahead and ask you, Cindy's. Um, she did not say if that had been answered or not. So I, there is a lot of information. Um, I'm going to throw that out there before I start asking. Okay. What if a patient is being transferred from an inpatient rehab hospital that they are stating they are not a registered skilled nursing facility? The patient is seen in our office, which is place of service 11, but is registered as an inpatient from the facility, which is a place of service 21. I know we have to bill place of service 21 to match how the patient is registered, but what type of evaluation management service do we bill for these? Do we bill 99221 through 99223? or 99231 through 99233 based on the type of service provided initial or subsequent instead of billing the nursing facility care codes 99304 through 99310 since the facility isn't registered as a nursing facility and instead is registered as an inpatient rehab hospital. Okay. That's a great question. Let me just explain that. First of all, consolidated billing doesn't necessarily apply for SNF consolidated billing doesn't necessarily apply for an inpatient rehab hospital. However, that doesn't mean bundling doesn't apply because that is an inpatient bundling rule. So if it's an inpatient rehab hospital, not a skilled nursing facility, then you bill the um, hospital code. If it's a skilled nursing facility, then you bill the nursing facility code. So you gave the correct series of codes, it's just when to bill which one, and then you have to look at the facility type. Um, office codes, or 11, as is, is we'd like to say, um, it would, which would represent office, those are only billed when they are not inpatient anywhere. So the inpatient status affects the bundling, and that is what makes them billable in that method, even if they're seen in your office. So hopefully I answered that question. If it's a rehab facility, then you're gonna bill the, those codes accordingly. If it is a skilled nursing facility, then you're going to build a nursing codes accordingly. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, again, if you have more, you need more, let me know. But uh, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and move on. Okay, that's all the questions that have come in at this time. Okay, so one of the things that I did uh, just want to bring up real briefly, and then I'll get back to the slides. If you're an ambulance provider, please listen 
to the information in the ambulance skilled nursing facility consolidated billing cl uh, class, there was a lot of information given and I did, I did exclude some of those questions because the information's already been provided. There wasn't anything direct asked directly, but we don't want to try to get into all the different components that go with ambulance because it is quite complex. So I would recommend that. All right, so hopefully this series helped you achieve success in dealing with consolidated billing for skilled nursing facilities. Again, it's not really gonna focus on the skilled nursing facility documentation. I would really appreciate any survey feedback that you have, anything like that. Um, even if you have additional comments or want additional education on skilled nursing facility consolidated billing, we can make YouTube videos and we can do other helpful resources to help you through that. If you would like to hear more about different topics, be anything, put it on the survey for us. We just wanna know what you're thinking there. Otherwise, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, on behalf of Taryn and myself and all of Provider Outreach Education, thanks for attending. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.